All right. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Carl. And thank you so much uh, to the organizers and to everyone for being here today. The last time I stood at this podium and gave a talk was at my dissertation <laughs> defense. So it's exciting to be back with um, hopefully lower stakes than that was. <laughs> Um, so the talk I'm going to give today is a, it's kind of a two part talk. I'm going to start with um, a bit of a tour of the ocean through the lens of ocean exploration, a little bit of a pick me up after lunch. Um, and then I'm going to transition into uh, some of the policy direction that is currently underway, which relates both to ocean exploration, but also kind of bigger picture ocean science and technology. So I always like to start my talks off with this image. And, you know, I know that with this group, I don't need to convince you all that the ocean is important, but I always find looking at this is just such a good reminder that the Earth is an ocean planet. Um, you know, when we think about the connection between people and the ocean, we're often thinking about the coastlines because, you know, of course, that's where we physically meet the ocean um, and they are very important. But, you know, as you can see here, most of the ocean, most of the globe is open ocean, deep ocean. And, you know, that um, is similarly very important for the services that they provide, like food, shipping, recreation, a heat and carbon sink, and home to most of the world's biodiversity. So this is usually the part of the talk where I kind of go through all the features of the ocean. You know, the ocean is deep, the ocean is cold, da da da. I, I think this group is pretty familiar with that. So, you know, the piece that I will emphasize is that the deep sea is a, a place of extremes. So it is very cold, except we have things like hydrothermal vents that are 400 degrees Celsius. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a harsh environment and yet most of the world's biodiversity is found there. So it's, it's kind of this area of contrast and extremes and understanding that is really critical to being able to soundly manage the ocean, soundly manage our planet for uh, sustainability. All right. So, you know, one of the most basic things we need to study the ocean and explore any any place, including the ocean, is a map. They facilitate not only safe navigation, um, but can reveal features and processes that are fundamental to our planet. The images on this slide show the evolution of maps of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge from the early 1900s to now, from, you know, literally dropping a rope off the side of the boat to the evolution of single beam echo sounders and now multi beam echo sounders. As this technology has evolved, so has our understanding of the way the world works, right? So we've discovered the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and seafloor spreading, critical key to developing and substantiating the theory of plate tectonics. You know, similar evolution of technologies is and will be essential to further exploration of the seafloor and water column and to addressing the dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss in the ocean. Incredibly, we now have the ability to map the ocean floor from space. Um, this is work that's taken place here, here at Scripps. Um, and uh, this image shows satellite derived bathymetry with a resolution on the order of about five to 10 kilometers. So really helpful for getting, you know, a big picture perspective of the seafloor, but, you know, probably not as helpful for things like safe navigation, right? Because you can miss important features like seamounts. So this image is a, a close-up view. It gives us a sense of comparison between resolutions. The background, that kind of fuzzy blue, is the satellite-derived bathymetry, while the center portion is collected through multi-beam echo sounders. This difference in resolution could be the difference between a submarine grounding on an unmapped seamount, um, or closer to shore, a ship getting stuck in harbor. From a scientific standpoint, this level of resolution can provide invaluable information to quite accurately predict where fisheries, species, deep sea corals and sponges, and other critical habitats, critical minerals, and other resources can be found that allows us to make good sound management decisions. So this map here, everything that's kind of in, in color, um, shows uh, a compilation of seafloor data collected with shipboard multi-beam echo sounders. The resolution here is from 100 to 800 meters, depending on the depth 
Um, and these data were compiled and collected through an effort called Seabed 2030, an effort to map all of the global ocean by 2030. Um, it's a slow, expensive, and labor-intensive process to do this from ships, um, yet the progression has been rapid. In 2018, less than 7% of the seafloor was mapped, or at least we had the, the data to show it, um, and now we are at about 21% of the ocean that has been mapped. So it's you know incredible progress that I think really demonstrates what we can do when we come together as an international community, come together across sectors to tackle grand challenges in our environment. Um, in order to you know, continue to shade out all the rest of those uh, portions that haven't been mapped yet is going to require new innovations and mass operationalization of novel technologies um, like autonomous systems that can reduce costs and labor requirements of shipboard operations. I don't, I don't think I have to convince this group here of that. Um, <laughs> but we, we have some uh, big challenges still ahead of us. So with so much progress still to go on simply mapping the seafloor, so much less of the ocean remains explored and characterized for the biological, geological, chemical, and physical properties. The deep sea is chronically underexplored. So I'm going to hone in a little bit on the biology to highlight this point. The plot on the left here shows the drastic drop in the number of observations of organisms with depth. So we have depth on the y-axis there, number of records on the x-axis. And that's a log scale. So it is significant um, how much less we know about the biology in the deep ocean. The chart on the right-hand side is the proportion of records of the you know, total records we have of organisms in the ocean and the x-axis proportion of ocean area. I'll draw your attention to that red point, which is zero to 200 meters, and see how high above parity it is. So again, emphasizing that we just have, we know so much more in the surface ocean than in the deep. Uh, because of this lack of observations and the challenges of making them, an estimated 90% of marine biodiversity remains undescribed. Again, you know, technology can hopefully get us into these places to be able to make these kinds of observations, figure out ways to automate observations, um, you know, co collect biological observations using different tools like eDNA, and um, how to actually process and share those data in ways that are useful and helpful. Um, so one of the certainly not the only methods used to conduct ocean exploration and characterization is using remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. They're typically equipped with high definition cameras and they're uniquely suited to observe behaviors, fine scale distribution and interaction between animals to also you know, make observations of um, the substrate of the seafloor, um, collect uh, sensor based measurements throughout the water column. Many scientific ROVs are also equipped with capabilities to collect specimens. Um, so that's organisms, water, rocks, sediment. And through telepresence, these vehicles can send video from the bottom of the ocean to your laptop or phone in, in mere seconds, which helps both to facilitate the science. You can bring in uh, scientists who aren't out on the ship with you to, to help you understand what you're seeing and direct operations in real time. But it also serves as a compelling method for outreach, engagement, and education about the ocean. Truly an opportunity to invite everybody into the deep sea with you. So what can ocean exploration data tell us? There's a mantra in the seafloor mapping community of map once, use many times. And I think this really applies to all sorts of data in the ocean environment. Mapping, video surveys, sensor-based measurements, and samples can inform decision-making related to renewable energy siting, distribution of critical minerals, drug discovery, populations of managed marine species, and biodiversity surveys and conservation. Ocean exploration drives innovation of new technologies, and it inspires people. So now I'm going to take you on a, a little bit of a, a virtual tour of the deep ocean. So if you go down there, and remember it's dark, so you have to shine a light to see anything, first of all. Um, what you're most likely to see at first is this. Darkness, 
with a constant rain of organic material slowly falling down from the surface. We call this rain of particles marine snow, for obvious reasons. And it's made up of decaying animals and excrement, various animal parts that are shed naturally throughout the course of their lives, it kind of slowly starts falling down through the water column. When you travel down a little further, you might see something more like this. In all of the ocean, there's a deep aggregation of animals, typically between 200 to 1,000 meters. The reason why these fishes and, and other animals as well live at these depths is to avoid predation by predators in the well-lit surface waters. These layers are commonly referred to as deep scattering layers because they can be detected by acoustic echo sounders, like the systems used to measure seafloor depth. Many of the animals that comprise those layers migrate into surface waters at night to feed. Through this daily migration, which is the greatest migration on the planet, these animals actively transport carbon from the surface to the deep, where it's more likely to be sequestered and help mitigate climate change. There's a huge abundance and diversity of animals living in the deep water column. And they have, they have some unique properties, as you can see. Uh, many species, from fish to jellyfish, shrimp, and squid, are bioluminescent. They can produce their own light. This bioluminescence can be used for a range of uh, communications. Bioluminescent ink can serve as a decoy um, when an animal is under attack. Some species have very specific bioluminescent patterns that help them to find each other, um, to find their mates. Some shine light from their eyes like a flashlight to search for their prey in that dark environment. Many of these deep water column animals, which are tremendously abundant, you, though you, you probably don't really think about them very much, are prey to economically important fisheries species like tuna and swordfish, as well as sharks, marine mammals, and even seabirds. And yet the water column and the deep water column in particular remains perhaps the least explored environment on our planet. And it's thought that there is significant und undiscovered biodiversity in these areas. So if you can, for just a moment, ignore that really spectacular sea cucumber and look at the you know, mud behind it. Uh, <laughs> so we've now followed that marine snow down to the seafloor, to the, the abyssal plains. The marine snow that we saw before creates sediment, this layer of organic, nutrient-rich sediment that animals like the spectacular sea cucumber you can look now can feed on. <laughs> that sediment ultimately can be buried and thus sequestered. And that is a really important mechanism for carbon to get trapped on the seafloor, ultimately pulling it out of the atmosphere. Without this so-called carbon pump, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere would be much higher than they are. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a bit and show some data, but I do always think it really helps to actually visualize the environment before you start jumping into charts and numbers and things. And of course, the whole ocean is not flat like that scene we just saw, there's structure. So this is a series of canyons here, seamounts like in this uh, chain here from the uh, Pacific. Areas with relief like the canyons and seamounts have are often well-suited to harbor diverse assemblages of sponges and corals, which provide critical habitat for fisheries and many other species. There are also sparse chemosynthetic environments like this hydrothermal vent, where chemical reactions using hydrogen sulfide or methane, which would be absolutely toxic to us, are used as the foundational energy source. And yet these spots are teeming with life, as you can see here, with mussels, crabs, shrimp, worms that are specialized with symbiotic bacteria that allow them to thrive in these really extreme environments. Through ocean exploration, we've learned that hy hydrothermal vents release significant amounts of iron into the ocean, which is a limiting nutrient for primary productivity throughout the ocean. So it turns out that these, you know, kind of crazy, bizarre environments that are you know, found in the deep sea are actually really important even for primary productivity, you know, normal sun-based energy production up at the surface throughout the ocean and important for oceanic food webs. But as you surely know, the ocean is unfortunately not on the best trajectory right now due to climate change, biodiversity loss, and other impacts. 
The ocean takes up over 90% of the excess heat caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So the image on the left here shows increase of uh, several degrees uh, Fahrenheit sea surface temperature across the global ocean over the last uh, about 120 years. The ocean also absorbs about a quarter of anthropogenic carbon dioxide, leading to ocean acidification and loss of oxygen. Some of the excess carbon, as we saw, is you know, ultimately buried into the seafloor sediments. However, that process too is vulnerable to climate change, as we'll see in a moment. And the deep sea, unfortunately, is not immune to these climate change impacts either. Much of the absorption of carbon and heat ultimately does take place below 200 meters. So these maps here show modeled changes at the deep sea floor in the year 2100. So temperature in the upper left is predicted to, uh, to increase. Oxygen on the upper right to decrease. And again, this is seafloor, but it's actually much more significant up in the water column in, at deep depths. Um, uh, ocean acid, pH, ocean acidification, the pH will decrease as we see on the lower left. And then uh, also predicted to have a decrease in carbon flux to the seafloor, which is a little scary because that's a, a positive feedback loop where the more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the less potentially is making it to the seafloor. Biodiversity is also threatened by a number of other factors. Pollution, such as marine plastics, make their way to all parts of the ocean and have been found in the guts of many deep sea animals. Oil spills uh, contaminate the environment from the surface to the seafloor. The emerging seabed mining industry has huge potential impacts on deep habitats. And overfishing and bycatch continue to be threats to many fisheries species. So this map here shows a score of cumulative impacts on the ocean from a range of stressors, fishing, oil and gas, pollution, heat, acidification, shipping. And as you can see, almost the whole global ocean, so everywhere shaded in that you know, red or yellow, is heavily impacted by human influences. So it's all a bit depressing to palate, um, and also probably not, not news to most of the folks in this room. Um, but there, there is some good news. The ocean is also a powerful source of solutions to climate change. So a recent scientific analysis commissioned by the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy investigated opportunities in ocean management that can draw down carbon, which are illustrated here. These methods include renewable energy, such as wind, wave, and tidal, transitioning ocean shipping to more efficient and lower zero carbon fuels, changes in ocean food demand and production, such as changes in feed source for aquaculture and shifting market demand to sustainable fishery species. Finally, natural ocean systems like coastal mangrove forests, salt marshes, seagrasses, and the deep sea sediments that we looked at already do a heavy lift in naturally storing carbon, and protecting and restoring these systems can help keep carbon out of the atmosphere. Together, these ocean-based climate solutions might provide as much as one-fifth of the greenhouse gas emission reductions needed to get us to the one and a half degree Paris target by 2050. Um, and then, you know, again, I keep emphasizing throughout this talk because of this audience that, you know, technological advancements like those that you are all working on here are really critical to getting us to accelerate implementation of all these solutions and, and really see that to fruition. Fully protected marine protected areas provide vast benefits that help to preserve biodiversity and habitats. And networks must be designed in smart ways to ensure a range of representative habitats are protected and that they're resilient to climate change. Um, you know, again, I've, you heard me talk about the deep sea. It's sometimes out of sight, out of mind, but it's really important that we protect, you know, not just the coastal systems, but also um, these, these different types of systems um, that are further offshore and further out of sight. The U.S., through its America the Beautiful initiative, is working towards conserving 30% of land and water by 2030. So now I'm going to shift a little bit um, to some of the ways that you can get involved with a focus on U.S. environmental policy and a, a few select international uh, efforts. I'm going to apologize. These slides are not as fun as the uh, deep sea video. 
<laughs> um, but wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to, to share this with you as well. Um, so in June of 2020, the U.S. launched a new strategy to map, explore, and characterize our waters with the high-level goals of uh, working across government and across sectors to map all of the U.S. exclusive economic zone by 2040 and exploring and characterizing priority areas um, to develop and operationalize new technologies that will help us to actually meet those ambitious goals and um, to share the science and data broadly. Uh, the shorthand for the strategy is NOMAC, which uh, stands for National Ocean Mapping, Exploration, and Characterization. There are a number of existing and new regional campaigns across the U.S. to implement the NOMAC strategy. Um, so locally here, we have the Express Campaign, uh, which is expanding Pacific research and exploration of submerged systems. Just a couple of weeks ago, the White House released a report identifying strategic priorities for ocean exploration and characterization to help uh, move this effort forward. These priority areas include um, informing potential protections and management of poorly studied marine environments through the study of sensitive seafloor ecosystems like deep sea corals, fish habitats, chemosynthetic environments. Second, elevating the rich history of ocean use, including by indigenous peoples through the study of ocean cultural heritage. Third, informing decisions on the sustainable use of our natural resources by exploring and characterizing marine resources such as fish habitat, aquaculture, renewable energy, critical minerals, deep sand and gravel, and natural products. Fourth, improving and forecast, forecasting and community awareness by filling knowledge gaps on seafloor hazards like earthquakes, tsunamis, and underwater volcanic eruptions. And finally, better understanding of the ocean's role in transporting heat, sequestering carbon, and supporting a range of biodiversity through studying the vast and unexplored water column. Um, so um, stepping out a little bit more broadly across the ocean science and technology space, the White House, in coordination with a range of ocean agencies, released a report last year highlighting priorities for ocean science and technology over the coming years, with emphasis on the ocean climate connection, resilient ocean science and technology infrastructure, and building a diverse and inclusive workforce. Some of the areas of immediate opportunity relate to wind energy, coastal resilience, conservation, blue carbon solutions, ocean exploration, and international collaboration. Oh, it's uh, really great to see that so many of these topics are on the agenda for this very meeting <laughs> um, and, and really align with uh, what's, what's coming down from the White House. At the start of this talk, I talked about that connection between people and the ocean. And ultimately, this connection is, you know, really the point of everything we do, right? It needs to, to benefit the people. Um, involvement of local communities is critical to sound decision making and science. Um, the, the U.S. ocean science and technology community has over the past year committed to environmental justice in all of our work, to the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. To this end, the agencies have collectively committed to incorporating environmental justice in our ocean science and technology work and to continuing to educate ourselves on environmental justice topics and approaches. Um, so a few other kind of current opportunities that are out there. Um, so the uh, White House, again, with the agencies, is developing an ocean climate action plan. It is currently open for public comment. Unfortunately, it's closing in a few days. <laughs> um, but uh, but there, if, if you are interested in, um, you know, kind of helping to inform that, um, feel free to, to put in public comment. Um, the U.S. is starting a national nature assessment. Um, this was announced on Earth Day this past year, and they just put out a roadmap for this as part of the COP27 announcements. And um, really looking to model this on the national climate assessment and really evaluate nature um, across, you know, land and ocean and um, ac across the spectrum to understand 
what we have, how it's being impacted and be able to start tracking it over time. Um, a, related to this is an effort to um, uh, incorporate natural capital accounting. So to actually make decisions in, that include the value of, of nature, the inherent value of nature and um, place economic value to that so that we're making more sound decisions that, that take into account our resources. The National Climate Assessment um, recently went out for public comment. Um, so, and that will be open until January. And then, of course, the, uh, you know, two big bills that were passed recently, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and Inflation Reduction Act have funds in them, um, related to the work that we're all doing. And I, I actually just realized that, that NOAA has, you know, put out this really nice website that links to all the different activities that are, are connected to the, um, bipartisan infrastructure law funds. So just uh, want to make sure everyone here was aware of all those opportunities. On the international stage, the U.S. last year joined the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. Um, there are now 17 members. They're all heads of state are the members, um, representing a geographically diverse set of nations shown on this map. With a headline commitment to uh, aim to sustainably manage 100% of ocean area under national jurisdiction. And between those 17 countries, they're now at 50% of global coastlines that are um, participating in this. And then finally, and I, I know I'm probably going uh, over time here, <laughs> um, so I, I won't dig into this, but the UN Decade of Ocean Science is currently underway. This is just a small selection of projects that relate to ocean exploration as I had started with. Um, but there's, you know, topics all across the, the board of ocean science and technology that um, are, you know, still looking for people to participate in. And that's it. Um, so I uh, hope that um, this gave you a good sense of exploration and um, the work that we're doing to respond to climate and uh, protect biodiversity. So thank you so much. Great. Let's take a Thank you very much. Let's take a question or two if anyone has them. There's one in the back. Sure. Hey, thanks a bunch. Uh, great talk. Uh, great introduction to what Noah is doing. Um, I'm um, a systems engineer here at Scripps, but my most important job is as a, a scout leader, and I'm in the midst of rewriting the Oceanography Merit Badge pamphlet, which is a 96-page kind of thesis. And one of the requirements that we've asked the scouts to do in the new set, uh, the, the rewrite, is to look at data sets that are publicly available. And like, for example, we're taking the Cal Coffee data set and we're asking the scouts to take a data set from two research station locations, the year that they were born, and then five years later and comparing the differences. So I, I've looked at, you know, I haven't looked at all of the data that you've presented, but how accessible do you think the data sets are? What tools may exist or that are under development for, I'm going to say, scout age youth from 11 to 18. There's a lot of data sets out there, but some of them are like trying to uh, translate proto-Hittite. So thanks. Yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, we, we certainly struggle with some of the uh, data archival and access challenges that I, I think everyone does who's collecting a lot of data. Um, all of these video are publicly available as are, um, you know, all the kind of sensor-based measurements, the uh, seafloor mapping data. They, they are probably, I think, more ahead of um, than the ocean exploration side of things because there's been a really big effort over, you know, a decade to try and um, consolidate data sets and make them more interoperable. Um, so, Yes, the data are available. Yes, we still have some challenges, but uh, cer certain pieces I think are really findable and, and could be really fun for the scouts to work with. 